can for the negative, and that's all we find. Uh, you don't have to worry about me going too far into the positive before we balance it with the negative, but it is necessary uh, to have the right balance in everything. As I mentioned in Sunday school, a lot of times we wear as a badge of spirituality this idea of being negative, and so therefore, a lot of people view Christianity as something negative. Now, I don't mean it's negative not to do right. I don't mean it's negative that you shouldn't do all the things that the world does. That's not what I'm saying. I am saying to you, though, however, that being a Christian is not a negative thing. And I don't think we have to walk around acting like it's negative. Uh, we walk around all the time with our, you know, we could, uh, as the old preacher used to say, our faces so long we could eat ice cream out of a butter churn. I mean, you know, because it's every, everything's so bad. Really, I'm going to heaven and that ain't too bad. And I've been accepted into the beloved. That ain't too bad. And I got, because of the blood of Jesus Christ, I can talk to Him when nobody else will talk to me. That ain't too bad. I mean, if I stop and think about it, I got a whole lot more blessings than I do curses. And one of the things he says in Deuteronomy, he says, listen, here before you is set life and death and blessings and cursing. But he says you should choose life. It does make a difference how you think about things. I don't care what anybody says, and I'm not all into this, think it and you'll be it, but there is something to be said for when the Bible clearly says, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. There is a reason for that being in there because God wants us to be able to think like He thinks. He didn't give you that challenge and then go, well, ain't no way you can ever do it before. He gave you the road map of how to rewire your brain. And the problem is, is that we don't read it enough, study it enough, preach it enough to let it rewire where the problem is. The problem is the engine. The problem's not the the uh, the, the body work. The problem's the engine. Uh, Philippians four, skip down to verse five. In the interest of time, I got about four hours to go here, so we may just preach this morning, just go right into the evening service, and then just go there. The Bible says, "Let your mo-. I'm not kidding. The Bible says, "Let your moderation be known unto all men." The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. Don't worry. Be careful for nothing. Nothing. What does nothing mean? The whole of a donut. If I were to give you nothing, what would that mean to you? A lot of people, you know what their mentality is? I got the gift of, uh, of giving and they got the gift of taking, you know, and that kind of a thing. If I were to give you nothing, nothing is nothing. Be careful for nothing. What are you worried about this morning? What is it if you have on your mind that is more important than if a rapture were to happen right now, eternity to be settled for you be over just like that in the twinkling of an eye, you're done for. Now, if you're here today and you're lost, whoo, man, are you burnt toast. Not only are you going to be left here and try to pick up all the clothes and all the blood and all the other kind of stuff, but you're going to be going half crazy. And then the Bible says that God's going to send strong delusion because you wouldn't believe the truth when you heard it. And then as you're going to go through the tribulation as long as you can live. You may take the mark and be around a while. And then at the end of that thing, you're going to go to hell and you're going to burn for at least a thousand years in the millennium kingdom. This is a doctrinal lesson. You're going to come up there at the great white throne judgment and God's going to say to you, depart from me, you curse into everlasting fire. You say, oh, preacher, I don't believe that stuff. Okay, you're really good. That's no problem then don't worry about it. You'll be fine. You're good. Everything's great. You're better than most. You're in church today. But you know what? One day you're going to find out your idea of good and your idea of what you think is going to happen ain't going to matter because God's going to be the standard by which you'll be judged and then you'll be cast in a lake of fire. I don't believe a loving God would do that. You won't find yourself in a lake of fire because of a loving God. You'll find yourself in a lake of fire because you rejected that loving God. It has nothing to do with Him. It's always God's fault. God's fault. It's God's fault. God's fault. I'll let you sit down just a second. But i got to read all the Philippians and, and, and Colossians and so on and so forth. Notice what the Bible says. It says in verse number seven. I'm sorry, verse number 6, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer, mm, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known unto God. And the peace of God, based on your prayer, your thanksgiving, your supplications, your requests, and the peace of God, passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds, and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Uh, I guess that sort of pretty much knocks out the evening news. Would you say that? I mean, how many of you would agree with me oftentimes we're entertained by sin? Sometimes we think just because it's funny, it's okay. Thank you, you can be seated. I'll pray in just a second. Sometimes what we think is, is that our way of thinking, it must be okay because everybody does it. Just because, listen to me, everybody does it, doesn't mean it's right for you to do. 
That's a lie right out of the pit of hell. Well, I don't really see nothing wrong with it. There's the part of the problem. The problem is, is this thing is not left up to your reasoning. It's left up to absolute reasoning, which is in light of God's Word. It doesn't matter if your brothers and sisters in Christ even say people say it's okay. What does God say? And there are some things that might be right for others that aren't right for you. Well, how do you determine it? Well, I don't know. You know, Brother Will does it, so I guess it's okay for me. That's not the standard of measurement. The standard of measurement is, is God says to you, it's not right for you. You say, well, but preacher, this is just what I think. Is it pleasing to God? Does it draw me closer to God? You know what? The Bible says for you to resist the devil, you've got to draw nigh to God. Is it any wonder the devil has so much power in our thought life, there's so much power in our physical life, so much power in our spiritual life, because the things we're doing separate us from God. They put us further away and make us more prone to attack. And then we wonder why we're so miserable all the time. And then we get mad at the preacher. The preacher's preaching judgment again. And oh, the preacher's dropping the hammer again. It couldn't be because you've gotten so close to the world that it bugs you now a little bit. It couldn't be that you're doing something. But see, the thought process is as well. I just think it ought to be more positive in the sense, listen, there is nothing more positive than the Lord Jesus Christ to correct you with the Word of God when what you're doing is wrong. There's nothing wrong with Him changing your thought process and go, you're whacked out! Stop thinking like that and stop trying to manipulate other people or threaten other people that you're going to do something if they don't do what you want to have done. We need to be controlled by the truth of God's Word. You say, well, how do I do that? Well, first of all, where I left off in Sunday school, come, you can leave your finger there. We'll be back maybe sometime today. First Thessalonians, if you would, please. First Thessalonians chapter number 5. If you're visiting with us, we're glad to have you. We're kind of doing, I don't do them very often, we're kind of doing a series a little bit on, on getting the engine straightened out. Uh, the problem is not so much the flesh. If I get you to stop smoking, drinking, and cussing, all of those are symptoms of engine trouble. Your car's smoking running down the street, not because the body needs to be worked on or you need a new exhaust system. The problem is there's a problem in the engine. It's spitting and sputtering going up the hill because there's not nothing wrong with the body, nothing wrong with the interior. There's something wrong with the engine. It won't catch second gear. Why? There's something wrong with the engine. The body can look wonderful. Those are symptoms of engine trouble. But the problem is we don't want to pull it in and raise the hood and look into those dark places. Ezekiel chapter number 8, those things that we worship, those things that have become idols, those things that have become special to us, those things that have in a sense become supernatural to us, those things that we hold on to, those things that we love, you know, that we've just always done it this way thinking. Well, this is just who I am thinking. This is just what I, this is just how God made me, really. Well, the Lord said we're to be conformed to His image, so there must be something wrong with how you were made the first time. And God said you need to fix something and get remade the second time. Salvation is the beginning of the work, but it ain't where it stops. But you would think from looking at most of us, after 20, 30, 40 years, some of us are being saved, there's been no change. You know why? Because in our engine we think, hey, because I'm not doing what everybody else is doing, making that comparison, hey, I must be a good Christian. And boy, do we get stale. We're like moldy bread growing penicillin on it. And back when we didn't have a whole lot, when that moldy bread grew up there, you know, we didn't do like now. You look at it and toss it in the garbage can. Man, we looked at it like that and said, well, I guess we have to go to the doctor. We can just eat this and have that as penicillin instead. And we picked the mold off of it and ate it anyway. Decrusting bread nowadays for kids when they go to school. I don't like the crust. What? You know what? You're going to get a crust sandwich the next day. And thank God for the money and the sweat that it took to buy the crust. Oh, I'm sorry, little Johnny. Oh, I'll, 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 Mommy, you'll cut the crust off of you. know, why don't you raising a whole, a whole generation of queers? And I'll be... Mo, mo, effeminate? And now that, there's, that's what it is. It's like, I don't eat crust on my sandwich. What do you mean you don't eat crust? You know, you don't eat it all. Next morning, if I was in my house, I'd be sitting down and have a plate full of crust. My daddy said, hey man, I get the good doughy part, you get the crust, that's all you get. And I left it out all day so it's nice and and chewy and and sort of dried out and stuff. Women have now become, this is not part of the message, but it'll help you anyhow. Women have now become where they're raising their kids to be uh, girls instead of guys. And now you're starting to see the influence on there. Oh, well, it's okay if Johnny plays with dolls. My foot! No, it ain't okay. Get a truck, boy. 
Amen. You, uh, uh, you don't play with no dog. Well, no, we just don't want to shape. No, nah, we do want to shape him. Amen. That girl gets out and she gets up in the morning and goes, Oh, where's the dump truck? Oh, uh, honey, it's right in yonder where the makeup is, where the lipstick is, where the princess dress is. Uh uh, we gonna warp your head. You ain't thinking right. And the same way the Lord needs to straighten out the way we think about things because our way of thinking isn't how He thinks. And so you have to learn to grab those thoughts and pull them into captivity and bring them into obedience to Christ. How do I do that? You gotta line it up with the book. It's the only standard of truth that there is. Notice what he says in 1 Thessalonians chapter number uh, 5. And this is the Apostle Paul that's talking here. In 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, uh, the Bible says this, we would have come to you. Well, I can't find my reference. Hang on. i got notes flying everywhere. Uh, it's in here somewhere. I'll get it in a second. There it is. Hallelujah. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, and or chapter number 2 and verse number 18. No wonder I couldn't find it in 5. Because it ain't there. Amen. I did study, I promise. I know sometimes some people think, you know, well, preacher, you just seem to be kind of preaching on the same thing all the time. You know, it's not because I'm not studying. I'm trying. But you know what? It's like that old preacher said. They said, "Uh, listen, you preach the same message for the last three months in a row. We want you to change. You know what he said? As soon as you change, I'll change. Amen. I'm just saying, that maybe the Lord's got something in there for you to learn. Maybe He's checking out your motive. First Thessalonians chapter number 2, excuse me for the wrong reference, verse number 18, 2 looks like a 5 turned upside down. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, Paul says, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan is not only a liar, Satan's not only a deceiver, but Satan is also a hinderer. Satan wants to prevent you from doing what's right. Psalms 107, quickly. Psalms 107. You say, preacher, what do I do? Well, if somebody, the devil comes to you and plants a thought in your head and says you'll never make it. You know what you do? You say, well, I don't know. I believe I can sweat and I believe I can toil and I believe in spite of the background I came from, I can make it. No, you go this. You go Philippians chapter 1, verse number t- uh, 6. He that hath begun a good work in you shall perform it under the day of Jesus Christ. Now, you can hush up that thinking. You're never going to make it. You're never going to do it. You're never going to amount to nothing. He that hath performed a good work in me is going to finish the work He started in me until the day of Jesus Christ, the day He raptures me out of here. So that thought did not come from God. So you bring it into captivity, and what you say is, is I bring it to the Lord, and I go, Lord, did that come from You? And the Lord said, man, that thing stinks. That ain't me. Say, how do I know, Lord? Because I gave you a Scripture that said, I am going to finish the work in you. For some sooner than others. Notice what the Bible says here in Psalms chapter number 107. It's a great passage. But oftentimes we get down on ourselves, don't you? Sometimes you doubt your salvation, don't you? Did you ever just stop to quote a verse in the passage? The Bible says, Give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good. His mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom He hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. I know, devil, what you're telling me. I know, self, what you're telling me. But I know that the Bible says that I trust that Jesus Christ is my Savior. I know that He said I'm sealed to the day of redemption. And I'm claiming to be redeemed. And I am redeemed, so I'm saying so. Well, somebody comes up and says, well, I don't think you can be redeemed and live the way you're living. Thank God the choice ain't up to you. My redemption is not based on what you think. My redemption is based on what He said. Not what He thinks. What He said. When He says it, it is down in concrete. He doesn't change when it comes to that. He's not like a person. He doesn't lie. When the Lord said that to you, but you know what sometimes you have to do? Say, no, I know I'm saved. So I know when I was seven years old, I got down on that terrazzo floor and I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I know I, I know I did that. Now I must be having another problem somewhere else. So the problem must be something to do with is I've gotten away from the Lord and I'm being attacked by myself and my own thoughts and by the devil and by other people are having too much influence on me. And that's because I've gotten too far away from the main thing, which is Jesus Christ, because I'm letting all these things define me. These things don't define who you are. He defines who you are. But one of the greatest things you see is is when you start listening to that stuff, you're more worried about what they think and what the devil thinks than what the Lord thinks. 
The Lord settled certain things, and what you've got to learn to do is grab those things. All right? Notice what happens. He gathered them out of the lands and so on and so forth. He's talking about the children of Egypt. They wandered in the wilderness and so on and so forth. They were hungry and thirsty. You know what? They messed up. They fouled out. You know why they're wandering in the wilderness? Because they sinned. They messed up. So, well, I've sinned. I've messed up. You know, there's, I'm done. Well, really, what the Bible tells you is, is that if I confess my sins, He's faithful just to forgive my sin and forgive me of all unrighteousness. Is that not what He says? Now, that's for a saved person. If you're an unsaved person, all you have to do is come to the Lord and say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, you don't get saved by confessing your sin. You get saved by confessing Christ. But I'll guarantee you, you come knowing you're a sinner. You don't come to Christ as a saint. You don't come as better than the hypocrites in the church. That's a lie also. Sure, there's hypocrites in the church. There's hypocrites at Walmart. There's hypocrites in your house. There's one looked at the mirror in you every day. Sure, there's hypocrites in the church. Stop hiding behind that foolishness. Well, I don't like them over there because they did so and so. Stop your lying to yourself. The real truth of the matter is you got a problem with you dealing with God. That's the real fact of the matter. Listen, according to Matthew chapter number 7, I know where it fits the constitution of the kingdom, but there is some practical teaching there. If you are always busy at pointing a finger at everybody else, it is pretty well assured the problem's you. And while you think you've got this great perspective on everybody's problem, you're knocking everybody in the head with a telephone pole, and you are like Samson. Everybody knows his problem, but Samson don't get it until he gets his eyes knocked out and gets the right perspective, which we'll get to in a minute in Philippians 4. But notice this, in spite of their trouble, in spite of their messing up, in spite of how many times you've fallen and done wrong, the Bible says a righteous man falleth down seven times and seven times rises up again. You're not out just because you're down. Notice what he says in verse number 6, they cried unto the Lord in their trouble. He delivered them out of their distresses. Okay, well, when I sin, I go to what the Bible says. Well, it goes on down the line a little bit, and they praise Him and so on and so forth. And then verse number 11, they rebelled. You ever done that? Then God, what happened? Watch it. He brought down their heart with labor. What happened? He put that labor on them to bromble them down, to bring them down. They fell down. There was none to help. Well, they're done for. They're toast. They're in the dirt. They're crushed. They'll never get back up. Oh, but then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble. And He saved them out of their distresses. That thing runs all the way through Psalms 107. In the interest of time, you take time to read that. Listen, you need to understand that when that thought comes in your mind, that thought is not of God. And you don't go say, Preacher, what do you think about that thought? Church, what do you think about that thought? Honey, what do you think? You go to the Bible and say, God, what do you think about that thought? The Bible says you're to try the Spirit's. The Bible says in the last days they give heed to seducing spirits. They're listening to things and doctrines of devils. They're listening to things. You say, what they're doing? They're looking to find answers for questions that God never spoke. Come back to Philippians chapter number 4. You say, well, you, you blew it. You messed up. It's, you're pretty well toast. Really? We just sang that song about uh, the Lord being reconciled. And I believe it's Romans chapter number 8. The Bible says very clearly in verse number 1, He says this, He said, Therefore there is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. He said, Preacher, I don't walk after the Spirit all the time. I walk in the flesh. Yeah, but you're saved. Your flesh ain't. And if you choose to follow your flesh, it don't cancel the contract He made with you the day you came to Calvary. You say, yeah, but Preacher, I've messed up and I've bowed up and I don't want to be around a bunch of good Christians. I don't know whose church you've been going to. You ain't been coming around here. Because you don't know what God knows about us. We just know how to put on a tuxedo and make it all look real nice. We stink just like you stink. We've had problems just like you got problems. We got B.O. just like you got it. We got bad breath just like you. We got rotten teeth like you got rotten. There ain't nothing different about us. We just have become professionals at putting on a face. Don't you get tired of that? Can't you help me just a little bit? You'd shout at the cotton picking ball game. I mean, just give me a little help. And let me tell you, this thing will help you if you learn to grab those thoughts, Second Corinthians chapter number ten, and bring them into captivity and bring it into the Lord and go, Lord, what about that? And the Lord will go, I can fix that right now. Better than going to see the doctor, come to see Dr. Jesus. He's always in. You don't have to make an appointment. Walk in there, you say, what will you do? He'll say, the Scripture saying, the Scripture saying, the Scripture saying. Well, then what they're saying about me. But what does the Scripture say? But what does the Scripture say? But what does the Scripture But how come it's about people? It ain't about people. It's about Jesus Christ. Oh, I just have this feeling that they should be treating me in such a fashion. Really? 
Doesn't that Bible teach you very clearly in what often we call the golden rule? Do unto others as you would have them... Don't throw up. Do unto others as you would have them... Well, could it be that I'm reaping what I sowed? We always like to call it sin, but could it be the reason people are mean to me because I've been mean to people? Could it be the reason that people ig me is because I ig people? Could it be the reason that people don't understand me is because I have a lack of understanding for other people? I mean, is it possible that if we would change the crop of seed or the seed that we're putting in the ground, we might raise a different crop? Keep putting in the negative thoughts. Guess what you get? Negative stuff. Instead of getting a leafy green tree that pops up and, and bears fruit and looks pretty and all that, we get this old dead, dried up piece of driftwood that looks like it's been hit by lightning. Amen. That's most independent Bible believers. No fruit, no leaves, no sign of life whatsoever. Just dead, just negative all the time. Just dark and black. The sky's falling. Everything's terrible. Everything's hard. Listen, when Peter was over there, Nero was burning people at the stake and Peter wasn't like, oh, this is the worst we've ever seen. 2012 right around the corner. The whole world's going to end. You know the Mayans say so. It's like, well, can I ask you a question? Why is that occupying your mind? The Bible says life is a vapor, like a fog that's out over a lake, and it's over there in the morning, and you rise up there, and within just a little while, it just disappeared. It didn't go up, it didn't go, it's just like you looked and it was gone. What happened to it? That's how life is. You don't even know if you're going to be here for 2012 to see it. Then you worried about it, and then it never happened. You know, I told you the other day, only about 8% of the things you worry about ever actually come true. Everything else, about 92% of it, it's either based on who you think you are and what you think you deserve and worrying about things you can't change. Amen. Most of it circles around those things in the dark recesses of who we are that we don't want nobody to know. The place that we worship. The image that we're conformed to. Are you in Philippians chapter 4? Okay, well let me get there and catch up with you. Y'all are moving too fast for me this morning. Philippians chapter number 4. God doesn't love me. The Bible says God loves you. Uh, well, preacher, you know how come God loves me and He's giving me judgment. He's trying to straighten the kinks out of your head. We're obsessed sometimes with negative thoughts, aren't we? Sometimes, you know, we don't realize that one of the reasons that we get so sick all the time is because it is the thought that counts. Thoughts do matter. Thoughts are very powerful. They're things that can control your destiny. One thought turned over an entire nation of Germany and resulted in millions and millions of people being killed and world war because of a thought. One thought. You know what you've got to learn to do? You have to realize this about yourself. You must look in the mirror and realize you are whacked out. I'm sorry to tell you that. I, 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 but you're nut jobs. Every one of you. you. You say, no, preacher. Now, you don't understand. Now, see, there's where you make your first mistake. Now you're going to go to what the Bible calls human reasoning and traditions. You're in trouble right there. That's a sandy foundation. Matthew chapter number, uh, I mean Luke chapter number 17. That's a sandy foundation right there. You're building on your own thoughts and your own reasoning and what people said and what's been fed into your mind since you were in kindergarten. You're a good kid. No, you're not. You're rotten. You are. You're rotten. You have to be told what's wrong to do. You, 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 I mean, you have to be told what's right to do. You don't have to be told what's wrong to do. You just naturally do wrong. You say, why? You're whacked out. Yes, sir. By how dare you talk about me? You know what? It'd be different if I'm sitting there talking about smoking today and everybody would be like, hey, I'm good with that. Yeah, get on them smokers. <laughs> Amen. Glory to God, preacher. I don't smoke. Get on them smokers or get on them queers, preacher. Right, right. Why? Hope none of them are here. Right. If they are, the little blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin. Right. Right. Oh, you can lock down on me a little bit there. Right. Oh, you mean it'll, it'll clean you, but it won't clean them, huh? Aren't you good people? Oh, I just don't believe God will let them in. He lets you in. What do you mean He won't let them in? Well, I just don't believe that. You better let God... Sit. Now see, now you're thinking this way. The Bible says, whosoever will, let him come. You don't determine that. You don't get to say, oh, there's a guest list in heaven. I'm the one that's in charge of who comes in. You say what? Then nobody else will be there except people that were just like you. 
You know what the Lord Jesus Christ did? He looked down at you and you know what He said? He ain't nothing like me. He doesn't think like me. He doesn't walk like me. He doesn't talk like me. He doesn't act like me. Nobody wants Him. Nobody will have Him. I'll take Him! That's good. And then you sit back and go, well, I don't know about that. You need to park that snippety, upright, pharisaical attitude that makes you think you're better than somebody else. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. That's the devil saying that. Right. I'll be just the one that decides. No, no, no. You ain't the one that died for it, so therefore you ain't got a right to say nothing about it. He's the one that paid the price, so He's the one to sign the invitation. And you're going to be surprised when you get there. There are going to be some people show up up there in heaven, and they're going to be like, are you name on the invitation list? Ask Him. And when you get there, the Lord will say, yeah, they're mine. You got a problem with that? No, 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 sir. <laughs> yeah, well, you can get behind them because you thought you were better than them. Problem is our thinking. It stirs up bitterness, animosity, and comparisons among ourselves because we think we're better than everybody else and sets us up as a judge. That's why you're knocking people out with a telephone pole sticking out of your head. You look like a unicorn. Amen. Toxic waste, toxic, poisonous thoughts, things that get in your mind. Notice what the Bible says in verse number 6. And what am I supposed to do about these things? Well, the first thing you've got to learn to do is, is you've got to have the right prayer. And who would have ever thought that prayer would protect you against the vain imagination? You've got to replace the imagination. The Bible says in verse 6, He says, Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer. Everything? What does everything mean? I had to go look at it again because I'd been quoting it, but I thought, well, you know, everything? The Lord's like, yeah, everything. You say, why? Because everything makes us susceptible to making a decision based on our own repertoire, our own thoughts. And what you better do is, is you better judge it in light of what the book says. The book will always be right. But our problem is, is you know what will happen when we get to thinking to ourselves, well, you know, Lord, is it okay? Everybody else does that. What's wrong with that? Let me give you some thoughts that you happen to have if you're not careful and you need to pray about. The belief that life is supposed to be pain-free. Not sure where Christians got that. Not sure where Christians got the idea that you don't suffer like everybody else does. The difference is, is God knew you were going to suffer and He fixed it so that the suffering would amount to something. The second belief is, is that things are always supposed to go according to your expectations. Are you toast or what? Should we just like close the service and go, Lord, can I just ponder that for a while? You know what happens? Expectations lead to disappointments. You expect people to act and be a certain way and they're not. And you're thinking, you know what I get all the time? Well, preacher, they're a Christian. Okay, what does that mean? How about preacher, they're human? Yeah, so am I, so never mind, i got nothing to say. You're saying they're a Christian because you expected to them to be different to you. Well, preacher, they're a Christian. I thought they'd give me 10% off. You know, brother-in-law deal. Don't lock up on me. You know what happens? You're disappointed because you walked in. You thought everybody was going to be glad to see you. Really? Are you glad to see everybody when they're here? You're, they're not here. You, they show up to you. Hey, man, I'm glad to see you. Good to have you. Praise the Lord. Glad you're here. Or do you sit like a bump on a log and then just wait for everybody to come to you? And then you're like, oh, they didn't even speak to me. Did you speak to them? They walked by and didn't say a word. Did you say, hey, how you doing? Or were you looking for them not to so you could justify what you really wanted to do? Maybe. I'm just saying... Sometimes that expectation, that thought process, that's not what God expects at all. But we expect it out of other people. And then that belief gets established in our heart. Well, I just think that if they're my friend, this is how they should be. Really? And then the Lord looks at Matthew 7 and says, well, I'm kind of like having them treat you the way you're treating me. I'm just saying, you put lemon seeds in the ground and you're thinking you're getting watermelons? You sowed the wrong seed. No wonder you're whacked out. Because you're thinking no matter what you put in the ground, it's going to come up how you think it should come up. You're not going to defy the laws of nature. And more importantly, you're not going to defy the laws of God. God says you reap what you sow. You put the wrong seed in the ground. Guess what? It's coming up. 
And you're going to have to reap that. Third, I only have about 50 of these. Believe that you're a victim. Oh, help me. Everybody nowadays is a victim. Everybody is a victim. It's nobody else's fault. It's their victim. They're being picked on. You know, if you just knew where I came from. You know what I think the Lord should do? He should put us all in a boat and send us to a country with no water, no electricity, and, and just for a while and see if we still maintain that victim attitude. I think He should ship us over to the refugee camps in Darfur. And down there in Africa. That's a bad place. And, and these people come in there during the night and they grab the little girls and make slaves out of them and they rape the women and then kill them or take them and make them slaves and they kill all the men. And then they pack up and move somewhere else. That's a real victim. And you're a victim. And come to church with a victim mentality. Everybody's picking on you. Couldn't be because you're a jerk. Couldn't be because he that have his friends must show himself friendly. Oh, no, 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 no. See, I'm saying you got to anchor it in the Bible. The Bible doesn't say, hey, you are supposed to be treated as a friend. He says, if you want a friend, you're supposed to be friendly. But I hate to tell you, here's another belief. Everybody's supposed to like me. Your husband don't even like you sometimes. Your wife don't even like you sometimes. Your kids don't even like you sometimes. Your pastor, he always likes you. People don't always like you. That doesn't necessarily make you wrong. Maybe they're whacked out. So you know what? I'm thinking this. I'm thinking, let's look at what the Bible says. Should I continue to try to do my best to fertilize and make a tree that ain't bearing any fruit bear some fruit? Or should I just realize that is what it is? It's going to be what it is. And so I'm going to go ahead and work with something that's bearing some fruit. I'm just saying, why don't you work harder on the relationships you already do have instead of being consumed with the ones you don't have? Because you think those relationships define you. Take a deep breath now. It's all in how you're thinking. Notice what the Bible says. Not, well, this is another belief. You're supposed to be perfect. Bible believers have been taught. Now that you're saved, you can never mess up. Because if you do, you never really were. Well, I don't know about you, but your pastor's in some serious trouble. If that's true. You know what? You're going to mess up. You're never going to be perfect. The only thing you can do is agree what the Bible says. And the Bible says that the Lord accepts you because of the blood of Jesus Christ, not because of the works that you do. And it's like, whew, man, good thing. And then you know what he says? Make sure you don't hold other people to a standard higher than I hold you to. If I can forgive them, forgive you, you think you can forgive them? While they're growing up, you think you can ignore the fact that they're coloring on the wall and doing stupid things and missing the toilet seat and all that stuff? You think you can give them a chance to grow up? I mean, I did for you. But you know what we do? We don't extend the same thing because now we're extending by our own thoughts. You know what happens? The thoughts of a man's heart are evil continually. So what do I got to do? I got to anchor that thing in the book. Come back to Philippians chapter number 4. This is so important. It's so important for you to grab a hold of. You say, why? Nobody ever wants to deal with what the engine problem is. You know what? We think you know, a little bit doesn't hurt. No, I told you this morning in Sunday school, a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. Is that true? So my wife makes big biscuits and that kind of thing. She goes out there where Zeke's been to the bathroom and gets some hot off the press, you know, puts it in there and... Just kind of mix it just a little. It's just a small amount for those of you who aren't here in Sunday school. And this will kind of help satiate you for not wanting you to make you eat right at 12 o'clock. We may not be done at 12 o'clock. Kind of like, I'm not really hungry right now thinking about biscuits with that in there. Well, I didn't say I ate it. I said that when she comes in and I'm like, man, I got my butter there. And it's kind of melted just a little. You know where the knife slides. You don't want it. To, you don't want the biscuit using it, losing any of its heat to try to melt the butter. When you put the butter on there, you just kind of want it to run in there real good. And I got my syrup ready, and I'm ready to go. And I'm sitting there thinking. And she goes, "Oh, by the way, honey, now that you got that all buttered and ready to go, I went out there and I added a new ingredient. What was that? Well, just a little bit of dog poo. It's only a little. It's no big deal." 
just a small inkling of the wrong thought leavens the entire lump. You say, why? Because then it influences everything you hear and it influences everything you give out. You say, what is it? Just a, t- just a, just a smidgen of bitterness in here. Just a tiny little bit of, of, I don't like them. And the next thing you know, that's all you're focused on. And before long, that little thing that started out as a splinter. You ever wonder about the guy with the beam in his eye? i got to get over there and preach that in just a second if I, if I can get around to it. You ever wonder about the guy with the beam in his eye? Do you think it started with the beam in his eye? No. You know what happened? It started with a little tiny splinter. But because he didn't address the splinter and realize that the problem was something in his own eye, and because he was so busy worrying about what everybody else was doing, that splinter became a stick. And then that stick became a pole. And then that pole grew into a 4 by 4 or a 12 by 12 whatever you want to call it. It wasn't always a pole in the beginning. But because he refused to address what his own problem was, thinking that it's everybody else that's the problem. It's my family, it's my friends, it's the church, it's the preacher, it's my boss, it's the people on the road, it's all of these other kind of, it's everybody else's fault. I'm the only one that has it right. They're all messed up. That's not Pinocchio's nose, that's the pole growing in your own eye. And then what happened, that filters everything from then on. So every sermon you hear, if you get like that, you're hearing it through that pole. It's like, oh. That's right. You need to tell them, preacher. That's right. They need to get that right, preacher. Yeah, that's right, preacher. Yeah, tell them, preacher. Yeah, get them, preacher. That's right, preacher. Yeah, and, you're, and, the, and everybody's looking at you going, man, would you quit hitting me in the head with that pole? Because you like sit as far as you can up in the balcony because you're beating the tar out of me. Is it helping anybody? That's us. That's what happens to us. Those thoughts begin to get in our mind and then we think, well, because everybody else does it. I'm going to get back to Philippians. Come to Proverbs. Proverbs. Chapter number 4. I get a little weary with this because we've come in this age and time where we're thinking that, you know what, everybody else does it, so it's really no big deal. But what does the Bible say? Yeah, but this is a different set of circumstances. But but what does the Bible say? Well, so-and-so did it and, 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 and they got away with it. But what does the Bible say? But see, what we made our mind up, this is what we want to do. I want to go here. Okay. Is it going to draw you closer to God? Is it going to make you laugh? And you think, well, because I laughed, it's okay. Let me give you a harsh example. Okay. Suppose I told a... Don't panic. Suppose I told a racial joke right now. And it was funny. And everybody laughed, including whoever was the butt of the joke. Let's say it was a Pollock joke to clear up your mind. Because I know you're thinking, he's going to tell a joke about TK. (laughs) That's how you think. Poor TK. Man, if I was him, I wouldn't sit there. He's been sitting there for years. And everybody laughs. You couldn't time that. And everybody laughs. Does that make the joke right? So you see something and everybody laughs. He just has a few vulgar words and just a few mocking Jesus Christ and just a few GDs and those kind of bombs and all. Just a few, just a few. You know what can happen? You can become so accustomed to that that it doesn't even bother you. I remember the first time that I saw somebody literally busted open on the road. Motorcycle guy. He hit a guide wire. And it, I mean, it was, when I was in St. Augustine, I mean, man, it just literally, it split him open. It hit the helmet. Helmet didn't do him no good at all, man. I mean, just literally peeled him like that. And I remember walking up and I, I thought I was prepared for all that stuff, you know. The first time I saw that, you know, I'm going to be the man, you know. Man, I thought I was going to lose my toenails through my mouth. I mean, that was like shocking to me. It stunned me. But you know what? After a few years of doing that, it's kind of like, hey man, we're going to have spaghetti for supper or what? And sit there and laugh and joke with people when they come up, you know. Oh, look at that, man. I don't know what he had for supper, you know. See, I appreciate you shouldn't be that way. Yeah, I know, but you know what happens? You become so accustomed to it 
then the next thing it doesn't shock you anymore. Some of you women, you've gotten so accustomed to cussing that it don't even shock you anymore. I'm just saying. Say, what is that? You can become so accustomed that everybody else does it. So what's the big deal? Everybody else hops in the back seat of the car and gets pregnant or has sex before they're out of high school. But the Bible says it has to do with the marriage bed being undefiled. It doesn't say anything at all about fornication for you. Well, I know, but preacher, you know, in the day and time we live in, I don't care if they shack up as long as I know where they're at. But see, you get accustomed to it. And you think, well, no big deal. Well, what's the problem? Well, we're going to go out and just have a couple of drinks. No, I tell you what, if you're going to drink, you're going to do it here at my house. No, really, I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't want you to be out there doing it. But if you made your mind up, you're going to do it. And then we'll just do it here. That's the new way of raising kids. The way I was raised was, you go ahead and take your chances. And if I find out about it, I'm going to beat the tar out of you. T-A-R. That was the was stamped right here. And he tried for a number of years to get it all out. And it didn't all get out. Second of all, if you get out there and get it done, it's on you. But I'm not going to condone that behavior. But now, well, they're going to do it anyway. Long as I know where they are. Okay, well, that's fine. But that's not what the Bible says. Look what the Bible says, if you will, please, in Proverbs chapter number 4. Look in verse number 23. The Bible says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Look in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, quickly. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. It does matter what you think, but after a while you get to thinking, and then you get accustomed to it, and all of a sudden it just don't really bother you anymore. You kind of get, I guess what you would call, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, you kind of get desensitized. You know, you've had something like 18 policemen killed in the last week. Why is that? Eh, it's just a video game. Oh, they're the bad guys. Eh, it's no big deal. Really? Your society is eroding where people attack the primary authority figure. Not the principal, not the government. When they attack the line that is between you and the bad guys... Your society has eroded to the point that they no longer have any respect for the authority. You say, but preacher, it's just, it's just video game. You know, kids now, they, I mean, they can pick up, yeah, you know what they've proven? They can work an iPhone and an iPad and a computer before some of them can speak. We're making headway, baby. Of course, they'd be in a mess if they were in Egypt because all that got turned off. <laughs> so they'd be like, They'll be, what are they going to have to entertain them? First Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm not trying to be harsh with you. I'm saying that what happens is the thought process gets going in our mind and we think, you know what, a little bit doesn't matter. Everybody else does it. Why you got to be so strict? What's wrong with that? Do you have pleasure in sin? Romans 1. Are you enjoying sin more than Jesus? First Thessalonians chapter number 5, verse number 21, the Bible says, Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Amen. Woo! <laughs> well, if it ain't good, you know what he's saying? Come on, can't you help me a little? Listen, why don't you choke on that? Listen, listen, listen. If my wife walks in with that same biscuit dough there, and she goes outside and she comes in with a fork full of that other stuff, and I'm like, what are you doing? Well, I just thought I'd kind of maybe add a little flavor. You say, what are you going to do? I'm going to hold fast to that which is good. I'm grabbing my biscuit dough and I'm covering it up in my life and she can get rid of that that ain't no good. Honey, that belongs in the yard. Or in a bag going out in the trap. That don't belong in the biscuits. How come you let that garbage in your head? It don't belong in there. But see, that's old fashioned. That's, that's all preacher. You know, you gotta lighten up. We're in the modern age. Well, look at how many hits I got on my Facebook. I'm popular. And you're presenting yourself out there in a godly way and standing there with the Bible in your hand, dressed appropriately saying, I'm going to church Sunday. Where are you going? 
you wouldn't probably get the same amount of hits. Who is it that's hitting you anyway? And can I ask you a question? I'm just, I'm just asking now. I'm just asking. What is it about you that thinks that you're so important that all these people are interested in you? Are you a movie star or something? Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. This is a hard one. Abstain from some evil. Thank you for whoever loaded me up. Abstain from the things that you think are evil based on the world in which we live. Abstain from all appearance. Appearance. Not the action, the appearance. The old saying is, don't bend over and tie your shoelaces in somebody else's watermelon patch. Say, why? They'll think you're stealing a watermelon. No, I'm just tying my shoes. Sure you are. What's that in your refrigerator? Oh, well. I'm not coming. Don't worry about it. (laughs) Abstain from all appearance of evil? Really? Can I just pitch this one out at you? Dressing like Hollywood? Not sure. And it goes for you men too. All this pastel stuff, you know, and this kind of... Look, preacher, I'm in touch with my... Uh -uh -uh. Uh-uh-uh. Uh-uh-uh. We ain't got no feminine side. If you're a man, you're a man. If you're a woman, you're a woman. You ain't like part man or part... Uh-uh. You're either all man, you're all woman. That's how God made you. He didn't make you to have two parts. Amen. 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 Oh, but preacher, I just... Why do you want the world to like you? Why don't you want the Lord to like you? Amen. Why are you trying so hard to attract attention? I'll tell you why. Here's the thought process. You ready? Well, preacher, I'm never going to get married. I'm afraid I, I, I can't be alone. I... Preacher, if I don't get somebody now while I'm young, I'll I'll never have anybody. Uh, uh, Preacher, I'm afraid. What what if I don't have any friends? And what if I never succeed? And you know what that is? That's the spirit of fear. The the Lord didn't give you a spirit of fear. He gave you love and a sound mind. Perfect love casts out fear. You say, what is that? That's a thought process that has convinced you that your self-value is who puts their arm around you. Yeah! That's why you dress inappropriately. And that's why you're being encouraged to show parts that you ought not be showing. That's why you're being encouraged to grow up too fast and at 10 years old look like you're 30 and your parents ought to be shot. Same thing for you guys, running around looking like you missed the bathroom in your pants and I don't know what the deal is, man, with having your underwear showing. Somebody should give you a good wedgie. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. Yeah. I mean, man, when I was coming up, brother, somebody walked around and their underwear was showing. It's like an invitation yes, that said, wedge me out, man. Yes, you call me whatever you want, buddy. But, man, I mean, we'd be like, woo! That guy would be like going, man, what are you doing that for? Your underwear will not be showing. That's why. You say, what happened? Next time that guy came around, man, he was like, man, oh, man. That's where high waters came from. Because they started wearing them way up here. You say, why? Because they didn't want to. Nowadays, it's kind of like, how low can you go? And now guys are wearing like midriff shirts. Showing like your belly button thing. And wife beater shirts. It's like, are you serious? What are you trying to attract? I'll tell you what happens. You get what you're looking to attract. That's bad. That's bad. You say, why? Because you think because you've attracted a lot of attention, you must be a success. And let me give you a word of caution. Flies gather to coconut cake. They also gather to the other stuff. And you cannot tell the substance of the stuff by the amount of flies that are gathered on it. Girls, let me just caution you. Okay? 
They will do, they will say anything at all to get what they want from you. And they will kick you to the curb. Oh, they love me! Preacher, we've already done so and so. Then stop it. Then quit it. Don't do it no more. You know what else happened? Come to 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. I don't like that. That's judgment preaching. No, it ain't. It's not judgment preaching. It's you're whacked out in how you're thinking. Man, I'm trying to help your daughters. Are you kidding me? Pretty sure my daughter's pregnant out of wedlock. Uh, uh, um. What are you saying? She's a bad person because she... No, stop! She can be forgiven? One of the worst things in the world is is when you try to present truth. Watch it. Here's the duck. Well, you know what you did when you were a kid. Well, you're not Miss Perfect either. You're not Mr. Perfect either. But does that negate the truth? Why'd you just duck there? You ain't hiding nothing, are you? Well, we want the truth. Oh, nobody is pure enough that can ever speak completely and totally free of sin. It does not negate the truth. Well, you ought not be like that. You never were perfect. Boy, I'm telling you, the second you do that right there, you know what? I know that truth just went whack. And the fact of the matter is you feel guilty for not doing nothing about it and you're trying to blame somebody else. Don't make me feel bad. You can flush it. You don't have to even listen. Here's the bad thing. You, you, you can if you want to. You can not come. I wouldn't want you to. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. This is the Apostle Paul. Just because I can doesn't mean I should. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 12, all things are lawful unto me. All things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Meats for the belly and belly for meat. And God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord. Wow. And the Lord for the body. That sure don't fit with modern theology. Well, I want my little girl to be like. Don't worry. They'll like her when they're slobbering all over her. Philippians chapter 4. Let me see if I can sew this up for this morning and we'll pick back up this evening. Philippians chapter 4. Let me give you the prison of lies that a lot of times you get locked in. The negative, never good enough, never never get a break, always got the bad end of the deal. Nobody loves me, everybody hates me, I'm going to go eat worms. Little bitty skinny ones, big old fat ones, I'm going to go eat worms. I can't do it. Nobody appreciates me anyway. I do everything, nobody does nothing. Negative, 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 negative. You know what the center of that is? You. I'm fat. Okay, we'll quit reminding everybody. I'm just saying. If it, maybe you can't do anything about it, but you don't have to keep going around. Why you got to be negative about it? Why can't you just let your personality shine in spite of all that? I'm, I'm sorry, ladies. I'm sorry that the standard has been held that when you get to be 60 and 70 years old, you're still supposed to look like you're 20. That's wrong. That's not right. That ain't biblically right. You're supposed to get old, man. You're supposed to be able to relax and have a bowl of ice cream when you get older. You know who's putting pressure on you? Men. To make you think your value is in what they see. You know, well, that has nothing to do with the Proverbs 31 woman. It's all in her actions. It don't say nothing about she was five foot nine and had a particular figure. Don't say nothing about her outward appearance at all. Whatever you got, do the best you can with it. Put a little paint on the barn and be done with it. Say, hey man, it is what it is. You're too consumed with that stuff. Really? 
He's working out all the time. So I wish he'd work as hard as Jesus. You'd be surprised. If you put enough of that book in your mind, you'd be surprised how much of that gym you could put down. Because it'll straighten out this. Your problem is here. It's right here. You keep working out trying to be something. You know what would be a great deal is if you just get past that and realize God's looking at the inner man. He don't care about the outer man. You're going to dump that thing whether it goes in a piano case or a shoebox. It don't make no difference to him. He don't care. You know what he cares about? He cares about where your heart is. How come you succumb to that pressure? Do the best you can to be as healthy as you possibly can and love the Lord and love your family and love your husband. And So what? You lose your teeth. You lose your hair. So what? It's going away anyway. Make you look forward to heaven when you get a new body. Amen. Amen. Well, I know there's a balance to things. You get whacked out. Problem's here. Fearful thoughts. Worry. What about my kids? Always think the worst thing. What about 2012? What about it? I hope we are raptured before then. I'm not thinking about 2012. I'm thinking about tomorrow. I'm thinking about tonight already. Lord, how many are going to be coming back after this? <clears throat> Worry. Be careful for nothing. What are you worried about? He's a good father, isn't he? He's going to heaven when you die, aren't you? What are you worried about? Well, preacher, it's just who I am. Oh, see? 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 But you can change that. You can go, Lord, that ain't right. You said bring captivity every thought. I'm worrying about something. I've got to capture that thing. Lord, bring. what do you think about that worry? The Lord says, well, I'm a good God. I got it. Yeah, but Lord, you don't know the stress I'm under. Bring it to me. Let me see about it. I got it. Been there, done that. I got it. I'm good. Two more and I'll give you this passage here. Get critical. Matthew 7, I'm going to deal with that tonight. Get critical of the church or the church's music or the people singing or everybody's an idiot. Everybody's stupid. Nobody's got any sense. Matthew 7, that tongue starts running out. Next thing you know, you criticize everything and everybody. You say, what is that? Well, that sure ain't God. Don't turn to Matthew 7. We'll go there tonight. Where we're going there tonight, you'll, you'll get enough of it. It might bring you some plastic to cover the pages because it gets pretty nauseating. How about this one? How about discontentment? You ever been discontented with where you are, what you are? You ever stop to think about God made you? Must have made you for a reason. But you know what? You find what you're looking for. Humminbird goes out every day and flaps them wings at however many flaps per minute and finds nectar. Bolter goes out, always finds something dead and stinking. They find exactly what they're looking for. You know what you do? You find exactly what you're looking for. Came today, you're going to find exactly what you're looking for. Ain't no preacher can preach you out of it. Nothing. You've already made up your mind. This is how it's going to be. And that is how it's going to be. Philippians chapter number 4, and then I'll, I'll close for this morning. The Bible says this in verse 7. I'm just going to leave this thought. The right praying with the right kind of, of adoration and appreciation, supplication, thanksgiving to the Lord will lead to the right peace. Verse number 7. The peace of God, the pass of all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Now, or through Christ Jesus. Now, let me ask you a question. Before you rebuke that, before you go, well, that ain't true, but in my situation, here, here's what I'm trying to show you. Does the Bible say that? Then either your thought is lying or the devil's planted that thought in you and it's lying or God's lying. Now, which is it? We know one thing. It can't be God. So it doesn't matter if the devil planted the thought, somebody else planted it, or I planted it. It ain't God, so I'm done with it. You say, why? The truth is what we're trying in the inward parts to set us free. So now I've learned how to take the thought, capture the thought, reject the thought, and then reproduce the right thought by putting the Bible in it. Absolute truth. I hope that helps you. I hope you'll change about the way you think. I mean everything. When you get in the car and crank up, oh man, there's going to be traffic on the way to the house. <laughs> Restaurant's going to be crowded. Preacher, beans are burned. Guarantee you. And then, you know what? Your husband's going to turn to you and say, you should have known after all these years you don't never put nothing on cook while the preacher's preaching because he could go till 2 o'clock. Think about how you think. 
Let's stand together and be dismissed. Thank you all so much for coming. We have more tonight. Working on the engine. If you hadn't been here, I think, uh, Brother Lance, well, we've got four of them up there now. You get the fourth one up there today? Okay, so it'll be four or five of them up there. And if you hadn't got them, you maybe listen to them. It might help you. Uh, what I'm trying to point you to is two things. Jesus Christ first and His Word second. That's your standard of measurement. It's not people. It's not the church. Not the pre- it's, it's not your thoughts. It's what does God say. And if you learn to do that, you'd be surprised how much better you get along with each other and everybody else. All right? Okay, Brother Lance, you dismiss us in prayer, will you please?